Everyone, thank you for joining us for this most unusual day where we are in the process of uh, doing a whole series of live demonstrations, conversation, and sales of people's pottery. Um, I am losing. Uh, I do not have Richard anymore. Yeah, it's okay. He can still see you. Oh, he can still see me, but I can't see yeah. him. Yeah, Scott is working on his thing, so just oh. talk, talk to me. Okay. Well, the, the, um, the format today is a little different. And for the past seven, eight days, we have been doing live demonstrations and conversations with potters. And the potters are sitting at this table rowing their clay and, and talking about their paints and, and how they do their firing process. But today you're going to see me, and I took my mask off because it's only a few of us chickens in here today, ones who know each other and have been together for a long time. Anyway. In order to make this demonstration and um, this conversation possible, we had a lot of hurdles to, to climb. One of the, or jump over, one of those hurdles is the fact that Richard's pots are all here in New Mexico, but Richard's in Oklahoma. And over the year, because what we're seeing, what you're seeing behind me is that represents an entire year of Richard's work. And while, when things were made, his lovely wife, Carol, brought the pieces uh, from Oklahoma because they were afraid to ship them. Um, and she would come here and visit friends and bring Richard's pieces. And so we've been accumulating them. And then the, the virus showed up. And because of the fact that Richard was a little afraid to come, and I can understand that completely because I'm not going anywhere either. And because uh, our governor said if you came from out of state to New Mexico, you would uh, be quarantined for two weeks before you could do anything. And so it just really made it impossible. And the reason that we're doing it this way, too, is we, if we try to reproduce Zoom uh, and send it to you over YouTube, the quality is so bad that it's um, really weird. So what we're doing instead this time is we are, um, I am Zooming with Richard, so you'll be able to hear him, but you won't be able to see him not until one o'clock. And uh, we'll have a conversation about his pieces and about who he is and what his process is until one o'clock. At one o'clock, we will then revert or turn over, we will then become Zoom. And in order for you to go from this YouTube viewing to a Zoom Viewing, viewing, we will be giving you instructions along the way on exactly how to do that. Really easy, but you'll have to change over to Zoom. But that way you'll see Richard, and you'll see what he's up to, and you'll be able to ask him questions, and uh, it'll be much, it will be just as, as though he's here in Santa Fe with us. Um, the reason that we're doing all of these demonstrations, conversations, and sales is because Indian Market this year has been canceled. And for those of you who are not familiar with Indian Market, it is this enormous sale of Native American arts and crafts uh, that has been going on in Santa Fe on the third weekend of August for a hundred years. And for the artists, most of them really count on that income. It, that is a, a, a very important part of their annual income. And for some of them, it is their only annual income. And in order to help, to help them to have, so they would have a venue to make some money to buy the kid a pair of shoes and go to the grocery store. After all, they're all self-employed, so there is 
um, <laughs> no unemployment insurance that they can collect or, or anything that they can receive from the federal government, that uh, we were hoping that this would help give them a little bit of extra money along the line. Now, if you wish to see who is upcoming, go to our website, Andrea Fisher pottery.com slash 2020 and the whole schedule will be there. Our normal hours are 11 to 4 but today we're going to I'm going to be doing this zoom where you hear Richard but not see him and see but you can see his beautiful pieces. I'll be doing that between 11 and 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock like I said before you can switch over to zoom not before but at 1 o'clock and um, then be able to talk to him in person. Now, we've been doing these uh, demonstrations and conversations for the last week and three quarters. And if you missed any of them and want to check them out, just go to YouTube and ask and search Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery. We have our own channel. They're all posted there. And you can see the demonstrations slash conversations that you have missed. In the meantime, this is Richard's venue for selling his pieces. Uh, and uh, we hope that you will take a good look at them. And you can see them here behind me. You'll see the ones that we have on the secondary market, the ones that Richard had made um, perhaps many years ago. Uh, and those will be available for sale also. But all the things behind me and the things that we're gonna, the pieces we're gonna talk about today are all ones that are brand new. So if you want to see them a little closer, go to our website, click on artists, click on S for Smith, go to Richard Zane Smith, and the pieces will appear in descending order of price. So the most expensive one is at the top, and as you scroll down, the prices decrease to the, um, the lowest price one at the bottom. Anyway, I think I've uh, sort of talked about everything, and without further ado, I will be introducing the voice of Richard Zane Smith, who is sequestered at home in beautiful downtown Oklahoma, and he will be joining us for the next two hours talking about his pieces. And so without further ado, may I introduce Richard Zane Smith. Hi, honey. Dejame, Andrea. Dejame, that means hello. Dejame, just thanks for oh. yeah, but it's also Yeah, it's also a greeting to, what would you say, Quay? Quay? Well, Quay, yeah. Richard. Um, Quay is like the hi, you know, it's like, hi. <laughs> hi, guys, yeah. Well, and tell me um, a little bit about you, Richard, and maybe a little bit about what, um, we're going to do and talk about today. Ah, uh, well, uh, we're going to kind of leave it open. Hopefully, uh, uh, questions and things will, will uh, pop up. Um, it'll spur a good conversation. Uh, you know, probably be talking about my my art, uh, my influences, things that have been you know I've been focusing on in my life. Oh, and if you hear noise going on above, it's uh, we got roofers, we got roofers <laughs> on, and they're pounding away. They're they're pounding nails into the uh, into the wood that were left left when they ripped off the shingles. So something had to be done because otherwise, if we got caught in a rainstorm, we'd be in trouble. So well, Richard, Richard, we were going to make something up about dancing girls and and about spirits that were. You know, uh, but I guess we'll just have to leave it at roofers. Richie, where, where do you live? Okay, I live in Wyandot, Oklahoma, which is the northeast corner of Oklahoma. We're, we're like a mile from the Missouri border. Yeah, so you just could, north of us. You could they, throw they, a rock. They, yeah, right, you could throw a rock to Missouri, just about. Just about. Just yeah, about. Yeah, shoot it across, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we're kind of in a, an area that's like the, the tail end of the Ozarks. Uh, there's a lot of uh, little valleys and streams and springs and creeks 
It's a, it's a beautiful area. Well, that's water, right? Water is a very precious word here in New Mexico. It, at, at my house, uh, it's only rained three times since the middle of March. And one was a nice little steady rain, and the other two were downpours, which means it all ran off to the river. So uh, it's been dry as a bone here. Uh, what do you think you're going to do today? Are you, I mean, you were talking about uh, uh, some of the work that uh, uh, you've been uh, doing as well, as, you know, pottery work. Yeah, one of the things I've been doing, I've been... Uh, working with some, some of the local tribes in this area uh, to help uh, restore pottery traditions that were lost. So just like the way you know Pueblo potters kind of uh, re return by looking at older pieces and older things that were done, here in the, this area and also the northeast and southeast of the country, there's all these ancient pottery traditions that, that are there waiting to be reawakened. And so we're seeing this happen little by little. Um, and first of all, uh, I've been, of course, working with my own um, people, the Wyandot, the Wyandot, and also any of the Iroquoian people, because we're all related. The Wyandot are uh, Iroquoian-speaking people. Uh, so we're trying to revive those traditions. Um, and my idea of doing that is to, um, to, to bring a student back to their original aboriginal kind of roots as far as the pottery tradition. Before they start becoming creative, before they start putting their own mark on it, I want them to um, to really uh, almost like make reproductions so that they get a feel for what their ancestral ties are. And once they have those ties, those ancestral ties, you know, they become strong uh, in their work, then they, they, they start branching out into creative expression. But I feel like it's real essential, you know, that they get into the, get their roots really established first. Well, learning to walk before you run. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, we've been, ex you know, I, I went to art school, so I, I was exposed to so many different things all at once. It was almost like just getting shot at with a shotgun of all, all kinds of ideas and thoughts from Asia and all over the world um, as a ceramist and potter, getting all this stuff thrown at you, and then you kind of just sort of drift from one to the other. But with our indigenous people, um, you know, that my thing is you're going to feel much stronger if you can uh, make pottery like your ancestors did to start with, you know, where your ancient grandmothers used to sit and make these pots. Once you have that established, you know, you're going to become, it's going to grow on you, and then you're going to start adding your own expression, and, and it's going to feel really strong. So that's one of the passions that I've been uh, with now. Um, Was that the, the procedure that you, you know, how you came to be uh, a potter and doing the things that you're doing today? Is, is that the same process that you went through, discovering your roots and then expanding from there? It was. You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting, though, because when I was uh, out in Arizona uh, back in the 70s, and when I started making pottery, I had no idea what my ancestors, what kind of pottery my ancestors did. I had no clue. In fact, all I could really visualize or what I could think of was the Ohio days, you know, when the wine that were in Ohio. And by the time they were in Ohio, they were not making pottery anymore. They had already uh, started using trade goods, the copper kettles, the brass kettles. So. As far as I knew it, that as a young man, I, I thought it was gone. You know, I really didn't know anything further than Ohio. And it wasn't until making trips to Ontario for reburials when we reburied our ancestors up there. Um, and we started looking at the museum collections and I started realizing, oh my gosh, we have such a huge pottery tradition. And, and that, you know, then it became really exciting to try to reawaken that can, can, for me. Can you, can you just... Can we back up just a little bit and fill yeah. me in? Um, the ancestral home of the Wyandotte is where? The, the ancestral homes of the Wyandotte are, uh, would be like just north of Toronto or Toronto itself, all the way up to Georgian Bay area in Ontario. So, And um, so when was the movement south? Sorry? When, when did the Wyandotte tribe move south? Oh, okay. Well, there was a, it was a, in the 1640s, 
there was, of course, the small smallpox was making a huge, huge presence, you know, among the people everywhere. And so the Jesuits who were with our people at the time were blaming our our uh, spiritual leaders, all the medicine people saying, it's because you guys worship the devil, that's why all these diseases came. And the, the medicine people were saying, no, it's you, we didn't have this until you <laughs> so guys you came. guys showed up, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so there was a split right down the middle between traditional people and the people who adopted the Christian message. And so that division caused a lot of conflict, and it wasn't violent at first, but what happened was some of that conflict, uh, some of the people escaped from their own villages and ran to the Senecas and said, you know, there's something wrong with our people. Their heads are being messed up. Their minds are gone. And you know, and uh, and so the Senecas were looking for a chance to uh, to, to even scores from the past, and so it became a bloody bloody scene. And and so the they led war parties up into our homelands, and to, and it wasn't just raiding for captives like it used to be. It was massacres, you know. And so the people split. So that Christian group went with uh, the the Jesuits to Quebec, and they're there today. The other group ended up joining with another longhouse people, the uh, Tienantate people. Uh, and those people, uh, the dominant language probably that Wyandotte speak today, you know, the, the language that we have, I'd say, is Tienantate uh, rooted. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated story, but th they escaped, basically. They're running for their lives, and they ended up down in Detroit around Detroit, and then some settled Ohio, because Ohio was empty at the time. And then they were forced out of Ohio to Kansas. And, and then some left them, uh, from, they left Kansas, some, some left in uh, Kansas to go to Oklahoma, and some stayed in Kansas. So kind of have these wind-up presences, uh, uh, or you know, little wind-up groups scattered all over the place. So it, it's, it's a complicated history, though. I mean, you know, it sounds really complicated and rather brutal. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, maybe moving to greener pastures or warmer climate is a good idea, but uh, having, having to be, I mean, being forced to do that um, because you're running for your life is uh, not quite as pleasant. So now yeah. in, in, in where you live, how many Wyandotte people are there? Um, the, the Wyandotte Nation of Oklahoma, I, I'm not exactly sure the number uh, no. enrolled, but I, I would guess maybe maybe 6,000. 6,000. Uh, the Kansas group, which my mom would be, be uh, um, were enrolled with, um, would be close to maybe, maybe at the most 3,000, but I don't think, even think it's that much. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we have the two groups, and all the same family names show up everywhere, um, like the... Um, like the, Smith? I mean, I know, where well, does Smith come Smith, from? But that's my dad's name. My dad oh. was not my dad. Oh. <laughs> my dad was white, yeah. He's from, uh, his, his family grew up in northern Arkansas in the cotton fields as sharecroppers, real poor people. Oh, wow. So anyway. But uh, yeah, my mom's name was Zane, and of course that's a whole other history right there about how the name Zane became a Wyandotte name. So. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really interesting to uh, trace names. I know a lot of, uh, well, the Native American tribes around here didn't have any last names. And right. depending on who decided to rename them, that's the, the different kinds of names. I, with the Pueblo people, a lot of Hispanic names. There are lots of right. Naranjos and lots of Martinez's and lots of Bacas and uh, those Sp same Hispanic names. And if you go on the Navajo reservation, it was when the traders came west that they gave the, the Navajos last names, but their last names were the first names of the traders. So you have Stephen and Joe and Jim and Bob and lots of big families with those very, the with last names of the first names of the traders. Very, very interesting. Anyway, so how did you come? Well, first of all, let me ask you, 
Uh, how many, you have 6,000 members in your nation. How many of those people make pottery at this point? Oh boy, that's, <laughs> I don't think there's very many. If there is, there's, there are some that may. Well, there's two people. that I know of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there's not a whole, it's, you know, it, it's something that I've been trying to reawaken. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, there just, it just hasn't quite um, sparked. I mean, we've had classes, but most of the interest that I'm finding in this area is coming from either the Shawnee, um, the, the, um, uh, some of the Miamas, you know, that are in the area. But these are all Algonquin speakers, so it's it's kind of a whole different tradition. And also among the Seneca Cayuga, who are a, a group that live just below the Wyandotte Nation, they're a blend of Ohio, what they call Ohio Senecas, who merged with Cayugas coming out of New York when they were forced out. So this group has been here forever, and they all intermarried with Wyandotte. So I mean, when and they have their longhouse, they keep the longhouse going, um, and. They're all wind up, too. Like I said, I mean, you, you, I've never, you, I have never met anyone down there who's not wind up, also, who's Seneca Kiyuga. And for some reason, in the early 1900s, when they were taking roles, it's kind of dependent on where families lived. Like the people taking roles or taking census would just say, you know, just put them on roles. You know, okay, you're wind up, or you're, okay, you're Seneca Kiyuga because you're here with this family. And so, Wyandots were put on Seneca rolls, Seneca's were put on Wyandot rolls. It's just kind of interesting. Got all, it was all kind of messed up. <laughs> well, you know, it would be really nice if the whole world was messed up like that because then yeah. we'd probably get along a lot better. And the kinds yeah. of fights we would have would be family fights, right. uh, you know, about who gets to the car keys rather yeah. than uh, major wars than we have. So maybe that mixed up stuff is not such a bad idea. Now, I know who the second uh, Wyandotte Potter is, and that is your nephew. And, That's right. And you taught him. Well, I mean, he's a, he was already gifted. I mean, he, he went to school, studied ceramics. Um, he even got a master's degree, which I never did, uh, in ceramics. So, But he was doing a lot of wheel work at the time, a lot of throwing and, you know, making kind of more European uh, and Asian uh, influence kind of work. And then... Then, um, yeah, he came and lived nearby. He rented a, he and his family, they rented a little trailer about a mile away. And uh, every day he'd come down, bicycling down to the studio and we'd just work across the table from each other. And so I taught him, you know, as much as I could, you know, as far as like coiling techniques, mm -hmm. and, and different coiling techniques and paddling. You know, if anyone's interested in looking at Jamie Zane Smith's pieces, just go to our website, go to artists, click on the S words, look for Jamie um, Zane Smith, and you'll see some of his work. Now, how did you come to do the work that you're doing today? Because I can't imagine that any other person in the world would make coils as skinny as you do. <laughs> Yeah. I, mean, I mean, they're just unbelievable pieces, and there's one piece or several pieces that we have that we're going to, you know, begin to talk about today. So how did you come to this pottery? From where? Well, well you know, again, everything that I've done here has evolved. Everything has evolved, you know, from, it's, it, I guess my, I, I think of it kind of like a tree, you know, uh, where it's like this creative energy is going into the trunk, and you go down this branch for a while, and then you back off, and you go down to another branch, and you back off. But there's always room to go back to those branches that keep kind of keeping those branches leafing out and keep extending them. So it's kind of like that, that's what's happened with a lot of this stuff. And the, the pieces that are in this in the gallery today they represent like years and years of evolving in in, in uh, direction, certain directions. And then, um, so that's kind of what they, I think that's the main thing. What I say, there's influences, obviously a lot of Southwest influences, because that's where my, that's where it started for me. And, uh, you know, finding, you know, just picking up sherds out of the desert and dropping them, but picking up, you know, the corrugated pottery back in the 70s and saying, how the heck did they do this? And trying to figure it out and doing a couple of rough pieces. I have one um, rough one on my Facebook page that I posted just yesterday 
which is like the second corrugated pot I ever did. Very rough. <laughs> and but it just shows you, you know, I was just I was young, a young man in my twenties, and I was just just had to try this, had to get this figured out. Now, did you? You said you went to to art school. Where did you go to art yeah. school? And what did uh, you study? Well, the first two years I went to Merrimack Community College. They're right outside of St. Louis, and I got a very uh, wonderful, really kind of classical art education there. Uh, drawing, figure drawing, uh, design, and ceramics. And the ceramics uh, at that time too was I was kind of a pottery wheel addict at the time too, and so. Uh, I, I already came in as a high school student who was already throwing on the wheel. And at first I didn't, didn't even think I was, I had um, time to put a ceramics class in my schedule to get this art degree in my first, my two year degree. But I just would go in the room because I had to hitchhike to school every morning. It was like 15 miles in. And so it's like, if I'm there at the school, I'm going to use that time wisely. And, so I just show up in the ceramics room and just get some clay and just start working. And then finally the teacher's like, why aren't you taking my class? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I don't know if I can. I have too many classes. I have to get these, you know, academic stuff out of the way too. And he's like, well, you, let's work on that. You need to be in my class. You need to be a student here. So uh, we talked and uh, eventually I did. I started, you know, actually taking um, classes with him. And he was great. Um, he, he approached it very technically, you know, so uh, he'd say, make 50 balls of clay. Now throw every one of them on the wheel today and pull, you know, pull them up as thin as you can be and just mash them, throw them off to the side. Just get them as thin as you can, measure it, and then, you know, throw them off. So that was, there were exercises. Uh, and so I was learning how to make lids, how to make handles, how to make uh, a very symmetrical uh, form. Um, this was all just technical training, which I am so happy I got. Because when I got to Kansas City Art Institute as a junior, the influence was a little different. Um, I mean, I did come as a, in as a junior, so uh, I fortunately escaped the classes of what I think are kind of brainwashing classes of, let's take this kid and reform him and shape him into something that we, we, we think art is all about. Uh, so I had all this technical training, and I, I right away, and I was pretty arrogant and really self-confident like crazy and, and all the time. I mean, I always was that way. I, and I, I think they admired that, you know, that I had that kind of, um, I'm going to go get this. I'm going to get this. I paid for this. I'm going to get it, you know. So. Uh, and then some. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. some. Yeah. And then some. But again, even in school at Kansas City Art Institute, I, I was able to scrape together the money that I could afford to pay for the school, uh, and I got a little scholarship, which helped, but I told both teachers, I said, I can't go as, a, I, can, I can only do this for one year, that's all I can afford. And they're going, well, we'll see about that. And after a year, uh, and I, I was attending all the senior functions and junior and senior functions, and the senior instructor would always look at me and go, Zane, what are you doing here? And I said, I told you, this is this is it. I mean, I'm trying to get it all in this one year. <laughs> and so he tolerated me. And I, I did. And then at the end of my junior year, I said, well, you know, this has been wonderful. I have to leave now. And he was just like, no, you need to come back. And I just said, I, I can't. I can't. And plus, I had been gaining so much knowledge because I came as a sponge, man. I mean, I was just soaking it all up. So I... Um, when I left the school, I had to find work for a while, well, of course, and wasn't <laughs> had, had very little to do with clay, just painting houses, making leather sandals, hundreds and hundreds of sandals to, to make a living. Hand, then, hammering uh, nails into uh, roofs. It seems like <laughs> the, the, the hammering's gone away. Or maybe <laughs> we're just used to it. You know, so, yeah, maybe. So you had this... Um, career, these career moves that had nothing at all to do with art. Well, yeah, and they weren't really career moves as far as, I, they were just like, I need, I need some money. You need some money. <laughs> so I, yeah. yeah. And, I, and then, of course, um, uh, all was in, at the beginning of, I know, it's a, well, at the beginning of 1978, I basically packed up everything I owned in a little truck, a little Chevy Love, it was a piece of junk. And I headed west from St. Louis, where my folks had lived. 
And I was gone. I mean, that was it. I was saying goodbye to everything. And I went, went, went west. And so I, I lived on the road for a year. And I don't mean <laughs> motels or anything like that. It's like, no, nope. I slept in that truck. I put a, I had hoops on the back and I put a canvas over the top where I could, you know, spend the night and, and you know, got my oatmeal cooked in the morning and soaked my beans for the evening meal. And, and it was just, you know, I did that for an entire year working in orchards, uh, just going from one little work job to another until uh, I ended up down in Arizona where I taught at this old school right off the Navajo Res. And that's where I met Carol. But I was the art teacher because I was told, I was visiting some friends there and they said, uh, we sure could use an art teacher. You know, and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> saying, oh, you know what, if you don't do it, we won't have an art teacher. There won't be, the kids won't have an art teacher this year. So I was like, ah. Guilt, right, guilt. <laughs> Do we, do we get any kind of income from this? And they're like, well, we can give you $50 a month. How about that? Oh. Like, All right, that's not bad. I mean, that, <laughs> so $50 a month. And uh, yeah, so I was our teacher. And then they needed a dorm parent because they had the fourth and fifth grade boys. And so I took 15 of the boys and became the dorm parent too, which actually I really enjoyed. I mean, the, the kids and I got along really well. I started learning Navajo like crazy. Uh, you know, and I, and, uh, but the whole boarding school thing, I just, I started seeing how awful it was, how ter terrible it was. And as a teacher, it's like, I don't like being here. I don't like being in this position, you know, and I really feel like what's going on here is kind of like a reshaping. Let's reshape these kids, you know, into something that we think is important. And uh, then we'll dress them up as Navajos when we go around trying to make business or try to raise money for the school. And, oh, it just really irritated me, but I love the kids. And uh, um, Carol t really did, too. too. And that's where we met. Now, Carol, Carol's your wife, yeah. right? Yes. And how long has she been your wife? Uh, 41 years now. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And was she teaching there also? Yeah, she had been there mm -hmm. a year before me. And then, uh, so when I showed up, this would have been her second year. And so she was teaching, I believe, third grade. And, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we met and uh, yeah, it just, you know, we became the best friends, you know, and I just realized, wow. Oh, nice. This, this kind of friendship, you know, is something pretty valuable and you don't just treat it lightly. And so I don't know how we got married. It sort of just happened. You know, it just sort of like, <laughs> just happened. It's like next it's thing. It's the you know, accidental like, wedding, huh? <laughs> yeah, accidental <laughs> wedding. <laughs> Wow, wow. And so yeah. all of that has contributed your heritage, your experiences as a student um, in an art class, your experience as a teacher and teaching other cultures, uh, all brought you to the place where you are now. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, when I was going to school, high school and, you know, in the 70s, um, it seemed like AIM was a big thing at the time. So I was, yeah. where I had a paper to write on history or present day things, it was always about AIM, American Indian Movement, you know? And so I was pretty fired up as a little kid, you know? And I was just continually, um, yeah, and hanging around with people that uh, we'd go to seminars uh, where some of these Lakota guys would come down from Pine Ridge. And I mean, they'd be like showing us bullet holes, you know, from encounters with the feds and, and talking about what's going on up there, trying to raise some support for what they're doing. And so it fired me up, you know, about my own ancestry. And I started investigating more and more. My mom didn't really know a lot growing up, you know, in Kansas. Uh, the city kind of grew around the Wyandots there. And, and so they were kind of absorbed uh, in, into Kansas City you know, with all the other uh, different nationalities that came, that moved around Kansas. Um, the Kansas, I mean, the Wyandotte were the first, um, well, they weren't the first uh, Native people there. They were Shawnee and Delaware in the same area. But when the Can Kansas, when the uh, Wyandotte were dropped off there, they basically had to buy lands from the Delaware, and they had to buy lands um, and because there weren't any lands left for them, even though they were promised land. So it was, a, it was kind of a mess. Uh, uh, so 200 people died the first year just out of 
I don't know, broken hearts from being forced out of their lovely homes. They had brick homes in Ohio. They had uh, log homes with windows, glass pane windows. I mean, some of the Wyandotte were the first settlers, I guess you'd call them. <laughs> settlers, and I don't know. But people who lived in Ohio that had glass panes on their windows. So it's like they were very um, entrepreneur types. They had a mill and schools. Uh, they had uh, you know, they, they started farming and had cattle. So they were already taking a lot of traditions. A lot of their, they had their dances, you know, and they had their ceremonies, their yearly ceremonies, but they had begun to change their lifestyle. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's a, it was an interesting time, interesting. And, and, of course, learning all that stuff when I'm, when I'm young and just having all this open up for me. Uh, yeah, I started course investigating one thing led to another and more and more and yeah it's been an obsession now I guess well you've reawakened the pottery tradition and well and even more so you reawakened the language tradition yeah that's that's another thing that became such a passion for me when I was living in New Mexico in Glorieta when we were living there um, and raising our family there I started writing to the Wyandot Nation of Oklahoma for any kind of language I could find. I mean, I was, like I said, I was learning uh, the, Neb the Nebizad, but I, you know, it's like I needed to learn my own language. And so I started re learning, uh, you know, trying to see what I could pull. And they really didn't have a whole lot of information at the time. Uh, they'd send me word lists, but, and I would take these word lists and I would do, when I would do sweats and sweat lodge, I'd use as many words as I could. And, uh, and I was just starving, starving for it. And then I met a historian who had gone to Canada and found these recordings that were made in 1911 and 12. Wow. Wyandotte language and Wyandotte songs. And so he sent me some examples of it. And when I heard those for the first time, and I heard, heard the, the language being spoken, and I heard it being sung, Man, I just, it was like reaching through and touching the ancestors, and there were sparks flying everywhere. Wow. Are you going to be the author of the Wyandotte English Dictionary? <laughs> yeah, we do have a, a linguist right now who's incredible, Craig Copris, and he's working on a dictionary right now. Yeah. Um, but he's such a perfectionist. I mean, and he's so, he just wants to get everything so right, he's afraid he's going to put something down that might have to be changed later. I mean, that's just the way it is with language revitalization anyway. It's yeah, a, it's it, a, but language is something that's dynamic. It changes all yeah, the time. It um, does. Yeah, no, how, how many people said no worries five years ago? Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> and now everybody says no worries. I mean, it's just sort of incorporated into the, the language. Yeah. And Richard, would you do us a favor? I mean, I would like to hear what the Wyandot language sounds like. And if you could just say, you know, a few sentences about in Wyandot, and, and you know, I don't care if you say, I, I love doing this, or I, you know, pottery making sometimes is boring, or my mother-in-law is a pain in the neck, uh, any, any kind, any, any, anything that you want to say, just so that we can hear an example of what the, the language sounds like. Sure, sure. Um, what I'll, I can do is I'll give kind of like an introduction, and then, um, then I'll, I'll quote one of, my, one of our um, elders who had a really beautiful a little expression, and I'll, I'll interpret that, but I'll, I'll start with a, a greeting and because this is what I do when I'll, I'll meet people or meet, you know, speaking in public. So I'll say, Koi koi o materu, so ha hiyo nijatsi, by Richard Zane Smith. Ni, de rome de huanda, nijatsu te. Ni, ni shano ni, ni kwatras ayo mendi a koyehtu. Wanda, the Romeo Wanda, ne ne sha awiya tonto da iju u task koi kome sa kwa kia sume ne hara hara hatitons amalure amgawish u tawa kia re amtarajuye 
Ahano maye o metsaraki, tune a hori shu. Itua enda reha de yo me hende te tuande. One hawa tenda wa tuano. Usa wa yera ha tenri on ta rejuvie hu sa mende hende tsa adus. No. So I, I, I did it and introduced myself and I said, I said I'm a wine black man and I'm, uh, my, where I'm from is, is from uh, northeastern Oklahoma. Quatro Sayomende. So it's like the Quatro is the east, the eastern where the sun rises in Oklahoma. Quatro Sayomende. And then. Uh, Your volume is fading a little. Richard, you may want to get just a little closer to the microphone. I'm sorry for interrupting. Is, how's that's this, better. Is that yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, then I, I, I did a little uh, something that uh, John Gray eyes who was a, a, a turtle clan chief had left behind. In 1888, it was, he was talking to somebody who was writing down his words, and he was talking about the the turtle, you know, the great turtle who came up out of the water. And this is the Amarurium gallus, which is our mossback turtle, which is the snapper, and how it came up. And the, all the, uh, the people, you know, were put on this turtle to, uh, to have a place to live. And then all the animals were created there with them. And so it, it talks about, it, it refers to the creation, one of our creation myths about how uh, the woman who fell from the sky uh, was put on the back of this turtle, and, and she took some of the earth from it. Uh, uh, one of the animals made a, a sacrifice of their life to go dig, to dive down under this water and get some of the earth that fell with her when she fell from the sky. And the animal spit it out on the turtle's back, and she took that, that earth, and she started to spread it on the back of the turtle, and she started to dance, the first dance. Uh, we say in Wendat, it's a yashitu yate, which is the uh, first... Uh, it's a shuffle dance. We call that a woman's shuffle dance, where the women just sort of, their feet sort of massage the earth as they dance. They don't actually leave the ground. The, the feet just kind of go back and forth. And so she sang, and she began to uh, dance that, and that was the first dance. So this is one of the dances we use before we do any of our ceremonies. We always have the women uh, come out and dance on that ground, and that, the earth has been cleared, so there's no weeds on it, there's nothing, it's just the bare, bare earth, and so we have our faith keepers come out first, and then their helpers come out, and then all the other women who are there will come and join them, and we start our, our dances and our ceremonies with that woman's dance. Hmm. Well, speaking of dances, this pot that I have in front of me, um, if you look very closely, has dancers on it. Can you tell us, and this is obviously not just a woman's dance because there are women and men holding hands. Uh, can you yeah. describe what dance is on this piece of pottery? Yeah, this is what's called a, a, a round dance. Um, and this is a traditional dance. I mean, they do round dances of powwows, but it's different. This one is, uh, and of course, all our eastern tribes, we always dance counterclockwise. So it's always counterclockwise. Oh, I better turn them this way. Yeah, <laughs> turn them the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way the bean grows. You know, the bean vine always grows that way. Funny thing, I, you know, when I, uh, I went to New Zealand, and I was down there, of course, you know, on the other side of the, the hemisphere, and thinking, Hey, I wonder how the beans go down here. <laughs> it's like, how does the toilet flush? <laughs> all right, all right. So, so I was visiting a Maori friend, and I uh, said, so I noticed they have beans growing in their garden. I said, can I go see your beans? <laughs> <laughs> so I went running out to the garden. They must have thought I was nuts. Yeah. And I looked at the bean plants, and I'm going, oh, yeah, they grow counterclockwise, too. All right, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 then obviously that tradition is true. That's right. Uh, no, so, absolutely. So round dance is kind of a unity dance. Um, it's one of those dances where these are social dances. They call them. Um, it's it's a way for cousins and um, brothers and sisters to come together and meet each other, and maybe boys and girls from other villages can meet. Um, so it's a it's a time where there's a lot of just that interactiveness, you know, and shy boys can be with shy girls, you know, because they have to hold hands at this, you know, a dance like this. Oh, horrors. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a way for boys to meet girls. Um, that's, I mean, a lot of these social dances, that's what they're for. There's a line about social dance that I, that I also have learned to sing, and it's all about it. I mean, it's just so funny. It, it's, it's got a lot of wind out word uh, sentences in the song, which uh, a lot of people have lost today. A lot of, even out here in our area where they have, you know, traditional stomp dances and traditional social dances, a lot of the little phrases and things that would be inserted in there in those songs are gone. I mean, the people don't remember. They remember that they used to be sung, but they don't remember, you know, what those were. And we're fortunate because we have these recordings, you know, that actually uh, we have a, a speaker who is singing the songs, and then she's going back and telling you what's being sung. <laughs> and some of them are pretty funny. Cool. And so this social dance is um, etched into the surface of this piece. Do these designs that are um, on your pot, these triangular arrow-shaped designs, do they have anything to do with the social dance? It's more uh, those those kind of designs, those kind of uh, diamond and, and also um, arrow-shaped, like you say, they show up on all the ancient pottery, it seems like, in our, our culture. And of course they show up everywhere, but but they're uh, real common in uh, a lot of our uh, wind up pottery, the ancient wind up pottery. So you'll see that diamond pattern or those, um, you know, those triangular shapes. Yeah. And the, the little, uh, you see that black kind of subtle um, swirl, or not swirl, swirl with a little curve line. That's uh -huh, coming out this of the curve line. That just represents, yeah, it re represents a river, you know, or the water, and, you know, the water of life, you know, which is about water coming and flowing from the sky and, and it's coming from those dark clouds so that's why it's represented as black mm -hmm. and it's it's coming down and it's giving life you know to a community so it's just simple things like that that are that are put together there are some some of the vessels that i have that don't necessarily have any kind of uh, real deeper meaning but uh, mm -hmm. you know it's it's just using some of these ancient patterns and, well well richard let's let's talk a little bit about uh uh, the source of your clay and how the, the process, that's what I'm trying to say, the process sure. of making your pots. Um, don't mind me, I just like to pet them. <laughs> I can't help it. It's, uh, you'll see my hands over and over again just petting your pots. But where do you get your clay? This clay comes from northern, uh, northeastern Oklahoma. And it, it comes from a clay source which has very few impurities in it, which is such a delight. I mean, it has just a little bit of shale rock in it. Um, you know, it has a few rabbit turds and a few, you know, broken branch, you know, little stubble stuff from, from uh, organic material. But other than that, it is so pure. Do you I have, just love do you have to stuff. get rid of all, you do have to get rid of all that? Uh, yeah. And how do you yeah. do that? Well, it's, it's fairly simple. What I do to process clay is we go out when it's dry um, and we pick the clay out of the ground just with a pick and shovel. We fill buckets, we take it home, we spread a, a plywood, a big sheet of plywood, put it up on uh, some cinder blocks so that dogs won't be on it. You know? <laughs> and we put the clay on top of that board and just lay it out there, crumble it out and just let it bake in the sun. Just so it's so dry, it's completely dry. There's no moisture left in these clumps. And then once it's that dry, then you restore it. Now, if we want to mix them right away, we'll take that dry clay and we'll drop it into water. And because it's so dry, well, as soon as it hits the water, that water just starts breaking it down, you know, and it just, I mean, it's almost immediate. It starts coming apart and the organic stuff floats to the top so, so you basically just dump, you, you put these little clumps in the water, let it dissolve, don't even stir it or anything. You just let it sit there for about two hours. And then after a couple hours, I'll go and reach my hand down inside that bucket and I'll see if that clay is already broken down. And if it is, then I'll take a stick and just stir it really good. And, and by stirring it, of course, all the organic, more organic stuff will come to the top. And then I'll take a little scoop, a little sieve, and just sieve it off. And then that clay is 
is I use a drill with a with a uh, like a paint mixer blade on it and just mix it really really watery. I keep adding water to it until it's almost like thick cream, and then I pour that right through a screen like an 80 mesh screen, and I have a a little um, kind of a hand crank thing. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's a really such a nice uh, little thing, little hand turn machine, you know, that I use. Not a machine, but I guess it's just a crank with brushes on the end. And it kind of helps to push the clay through the screen. But you don't have to brush very hard. You just you just kind of turn the crank really easily and um, and just make sure that clay is going through. Whatever sticks to the top of the screen, I either I'll look at it. And if it's full of organic stuff, I just toss it out. If it's full of, um, if it looks like good clay, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, put it back in the bucket and stir it again, re-stir it. So, so once I put it through that uh, fine screen, though, it's, it's clay. You know, everything's there. And then it just has to be, uh, then I just have to add temperature afterward. But basically, I'll let that, let that water separate, siphon it off, just siphon off a little water. Uh, day by day, and let the water do the work, really. It's a, it's really simple, very simple process. Now, do you age your clay at all before you start to use it? it yeah, it, my, I usually mix up enough clay for a year, so... Oh, and, how, that, and how much yeah. clay is that? For five. me, it's about four of a five-gallon buckets full. Mm -hmm. yeah, three to four. Um, and because I have slowed down a little bit, I'm not working quite as big as I used to, and I'm not, you know, I'm not doing quite as many pieces. Um, I could probably, do, you know, get away with three, three buckets a, uh, a year. Not if I have uh, anything to say about it. <laughs> what's that? Sorry? I said not if I have anything to say about it. I want you to oh. use all five <laughs> buckets because we love having your pieces here. Now, once you um, have the clay is all ready to go, um, then what do you do? Um, okay, then once once I um, I've soaked the clay, I'll just get to this part when I. I soak the clay and, and uh, siphon off all the water, continually do that until there's no more water that comes to the top, no more. Then I'll take and add the temper to it. Now, for temper, I've got a couple of things I've been doing. Um, there's different stuff. I've been using either volcanic ash, for like that pot you have in front of you, um, that top part of the clay, which has been uh, burnished, that is from one coil. One coil of clay that was put on and pulled up, just kind of pulled up. I don't like the way a muck our piece by is pulled up, kind of tugged up real gently. And, um, so, and that's, that's uh, the same clay, but it's mixed with volcanic ash. So it's, it's easy to burnish, and you don't have to worry about uh, little chunks of stuff, you know, kind of showing. Uh, the, the clay below it has been mixed with either um, some of the, the granite, um, you know, crushed granite that I've gotten over there at uh, Derek's, near Derek's place. Or um, it could be a flint temper. There's a crushed flint, which I've been using, which is really nice. Um, or there's um, another one, which I've been using for outdoor firing, and it's called kyanite. It's a, it's a crushed um, crystal, some kind of a crystal. It's kind of black. It looks almost like... Um, like the old, um, oh, like cinders. It almost looks like cinders, and it's very heavy. And but if you if you screen it real fine, it makes a really nice, um, nice temper too. So then, when the temper's added, uh, I just blown that in really good, and then then it's done. I'll just set those buckets like that aside, and when I'm if I have. Uh, in two weeks, like um, I need to have some clay ready in two weeks, and I'll take some of that, or, or even a week, I'll take some of that out of a bucket and just put it into sort of a, almost like a bowl, a plaster bowl. It's a very, uh, kind of like a platter shape, and I'll, I'll have it lined with, with a cloth. And I'll just put that clay in there and smear it in there, and in a few days, that clay is ready to, to uh, wedge up, and it's ready to go.
Wow. And then uh, after the, the pot has been made, you, uh, you leave the coils exposed. Right. Mm -hmm. But the inside is all finished. And is that where, right. is that the main part where, the, where you really um, stick the clay together? <laughs> yeah, um, this technique, this ancient corrugated technique, which is ancient Pueblo, um, you know, the corrugation, if it's done right, there are no seams inside the pot. You won't see it because the coil is actually put on the side. The, you know, and so you roll the coil, and you put it on the side uh, that's been prepared already, it's been flattened, and then you flatten it again, you pinch that coil flat. And when, by pinching it flat, it gives you uh, a surface to put the next coil on. And you always put the coil below the top edge. So you never have seams going all the way through on the inside of the pot. If you looked in a pot, there would never be seams. It might be rough inside. It might be a little bumpy, but it won't be, uh, there won't be any, uh, you know, do um, you hear that boom? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody drops something on the roof. <laughs> I hope it didn't go through. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. <laughs> I don't see anybody's feet hanging through or anything. No. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's that's the technique, and it's it's a little difficult at first to learn for people. Um, you know, I know there are some people doing corrugated pottery, um, but the way the ancients did it is that it, it has a, an amazing way of, of becoming very thin. Um, because you're flattening those coils, they're very, very flat. And then that little coil that goes on it is stuck right in the middle of it. It's not put up to the top or anything. So yeah, it's very difficult to describe just by words. Um, and you know, that's why it's kind of nice to do demos there too. Mm -hmm. Just this year we're not able to. Well, no, this year not work. But um, as Miss Scarlett said, Next year is another year, or was it tomorrow's Absolutely. another day? <laughs> but uh, we'll do that again uh, next year. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, this particular piece, hmm, let me put my glasses on. It is, I can't read the tag. Shame on me. <laughs> I should know by now. But all, all the pieces that you'll see here on the table, they're all uh, Richard's brand new pieces and they're all for sale. And this one is $6,900. How many hours do you think it took for you to make this pot? Uh, um, well, well you, first of all, you had to dig the clay for a whole year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you had to soak and you had to sift and all that stuff. We won't count that. Right. Uh, but a, that's part of it. And of course, you can't count the uh, mixing of the slips, you know, the clay colors, getting all the shading and all the, you know, those mixed together. And, These are all uh, natural colors. Yeah, well, they're, um, they're, I guess, up to a point. They're all, yeah, I mean, they have to be natural. Uh, in fact, otherwise, they would burn off. You know, anything that's uh, like, okay, but I do put ceramic stains. You know, I use ceramic stains, which would be the blacks, um, and those are. Very likely, I don't. They don't tell you what their stains are, but they're probably manganese based and whatever. You know, I, I don't know. They like I say when I buy stains. If I do buy stains, I'll buy like a blue stain because I can always mix that with a red iron. My my the purples, and um, I'll buy a, a yellow if I want to kind of make a brighter orange. And I'll uh, let's see. I think I have enough of. I pretty much have enough of these for the rest of my life because it doesn't take much. <laughs> you know, you buy a little bit of ceramic stain, it lasts forever. Um, and then I mix them with oxides. But some of those colors, too, are made from a clay that's up in the Jemez Mountains that I, that's on the side of the road. Um, and I, just there's whatever you see, you, know, you just kind of drive. I drive along and I see something off to the side of the road. It looks really nice, and it's not on the res. <laughs> and I'd like to stop up for a, you know, for a sample and, and take it and try it out and see how it works. And so the orange, there's a really beautiful orange that comes from up there in the hand has. Um, but the red comes from an iron oxide that I, that I also buy. 
So it's a combination of uh, things that you may purchase at a ceramic store that is made that is um, prepared uh, for to be used on ceramic, or you gather the minerals from various areas and produce uh, a stain that you paint onto the surface. And that's no, all done no. before the firing or um, after? On that particular piece, yes. Everything was done before. Uh, there are a couple pieces there in the show that are fired three times, though, because it took a three firing process to be able to make it work. So th but that particular piece there was just once fired. Mm -hmm. And I've been using an electric kiln to fire these, the ones, because my, my wood kiln, um, though I, I used to use it all the time, um, it, it tended to kind of uh, bring out a lot of the colors, especially purples and blues. It tended to kind of gray them out, and I, I was just getting really tired of that, having to battle that and repaint and refire. So uh, I have them for clean colors. Uh, yeah, it, it's like the only one being real clean colors is to use electric kiln, which I don't mind. It is it because you can control the temperature in the, uh, the electric kiln a little bit better than in the wood kiln? Um, the wood kiln I have, you can control it pretty well, actually, but but it's just, what happens is you get smoke, you know, the smoke will um, find, it, it tends to like one part of the, uh, of the kiln, so the smoke will start kind of running up one side of the wall of the kiln, and then it, that's the one that will always run up that side, and so that side of it, if it's facing the smoke, that pot, uh, if it's big, it's a big one especially, and it's facing the smoke, that place will be the spot that gets kind of grayed out. Mm. Uh -huh. It looks like it's almost faded, you know, it looks like color fading. So these colors are permanent? On, oh yeah, on these, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're natural colors. Even, even the commercial ones are natural, they're just minerals that have been mixed together. So, yeah, they're permanent. You, I mean, you see my hand <laughs> on your pots all the time because I, I just, I want to pet them. They feel good. They feel really good. Uh, we have another piece here. And if you'll just give me a second, I will remove this one. And like I said, all the pieces that you're going to see today, they are all for sale. This, oh my, my, what a honey this one is. Uh, so let's start. Let's start with the coils because it will be a nice transition uh, from this pot, from the last pot to this pot. Because these coils look very, very different. Yeah. Now this one, yeah, the um, the coils are put on the same way. But before I add another coil, I go. I use my fingernail and I just run it along and just pinch as I go. So I'm just pinching with that. And so it has that little ridges, the little ridges are, are put in there. Um, so did your fingernails wear out because there are at least a billion little ridges on, the, <laughs> on this piece? <laughs> Actually, it seems like it's better to have not much put your nap because if your fingernail is too long, it tends to, to dig out clay. So I actually have to kind of grind them down a little bit so that it's just the slightest little indentation. Yeah. But those are, you know, those are ones that I looked at and studied on you know, the old ones. You know, the old, it's like, oh my goodness, look at those fingerprints. They're 900 years old on an old piece, of, you know, an old shirt. And so I just, I just love that. The, and the if you look inside, yeah, if you look inside this pot, you can see that uh, the remnants of that technique that you were talking about on how you lay the coil to the front of the coil below it and then smooth the inside. And you can see some of that texture that, that where, where you're you know, attempting to smooth it all out and attach yeah. one coil to the other. But what is so uh, noticeable about this pot is this outrageous handle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now this is not yeah. something you learn to do like you said we were throwing pots in art school, but instead you were learning how to make spouts and handles and and right. uh, 
uh, all the other things that go along with all the other attachments to pieces of pottery. But this handle is really unbelievable. Tell us about it. Yeah, here where we live, we have this beautiful little creek that runs through the property. And every time it floods, uh, which it does usually once a year, last year, I think it flooded seven times. This year, we haven't had one flood. Uh, but what happens is the banks of the, of the creek start exposing the roots of trees you know, that are being, they're just sticking out. And as I walk down the creek, uh, I'm always keeping my eye out for the, the right, just the right shapes, you know, it's like looking for those incredible root shapes, you know, that would make just a beautiful addition. The idea of the root, you know, the, the whole thing of roots itself, you know, is that this is what all tradition is about, you know, it's that hidden part of a person that's in the ground uh, that gives them strength, that gives them all that... Um, energy, you know, to keep going, to keep going. And when you see them exposed like that, it's kind of like when you're learning a, a language, your own language for the first time, your roots are exposed. And so you see them, and you see how those, how that language was made. Because now we're having to study it kind of like a linguist would. We're not, it's not like, you know, you're growing up and you're just being told, no, this is how you say it. Well, why do you say it that way? And the elders say, I don't know. This is what you say. <laughs> well, we have to learn why things are said the way they are. And so it's like these roots. You know, these roots are like, this is, uh, you see what the rocks, like the rocks that are embedded in roots. These roots are searching, going through the ground, looking for moisture, just looking for that light. You know, and they're, um, and they're wrapping themselves around the stone. And, and so there's this amazing thing that happens. And it's, it's like when you, when you take a piece of this root, it's like you're, you're taking a photo, in a way, of a growth process that happened for years and years, uh, and, and you're just add, adding it on. You know? I mean, it's just, yeah, they're, they're like art pieces in themselves. Um, but, well, how, where, how did you get the rock in here? If you can see, there's a, uh, a, a the root that's sort of twisted around this rock. How did that happen? Yeah, the, that's the way the roots grow. You know, and when they're exposed, you see these rocks stuck in them like that. What I usually do is I take all the bark off of these uh, roots and then sand them like crazy. And it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes more time just to, uh, to finish the ha a handle than it does to actually build the pot. <laughs> but uh, uh, so occasionally, the, uh, the stone might become a little loosened because I've been sanding. And so I'll take, actually remove the rock sometimes. Some of them I can't. There's no way I can get them out. And, um, and then I'll do all the sanding, and then I'll actually glue it back in place if I need to. I think that's one that I had to re-glue, so I'll epoxy it back into where, where it was originally. Now, you said you take the bark off the roots? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Roots have bark? I, yeah, don't, sure do. I, don't, yeah. I don't, didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, and then like the elm, uh, elm bark that we have out here, you know, if you, if you cut one, one end of it and you pull it, you get this, this long strip. So it's, yeah, some of them grow that way. Some of them are just, they just kind of pop off like little pieces. Um, so yeah, each tree has its own unique kind of bark on the roots too. Like sycamore is kind of a, uh, it's a hard root, a hard uh, bark to get off, uh, unless it's kind of rotted, half rotted, or it's it's starting to be in the weather where it kind of flakes. But those those take a lot of time. That one might be, I I think this one's a sycamore root. That's oh. what most of the roots around that I use. They're the gnarliest and the nicest that I like. Wow. And how do you attach them to the pot? Um, there's holes that are cut in the in the pot while the clay is still soft. And then I use this cord, which is a cotton cord that's got a, some kind of a, like a, a waxed surface on it or something. There, it's a, it's a, I guess it's like a braided cord. And it's, it's just been, yeah, it's a kind of a knot uh, that I learned looking at uh, some of the Japanese basketry. 
when I was exploring some of the, the knots and things that the Japanese were using, and I just love those, those beautiful rosette knots. Wow. So, how long did it take to make this one? <laughs> uh, I, I, I usually say, with pieces like this, it's like a two-week process, you know, from, to get it all, yeah, get it done. And, and the other one as well. I mean, pretty much two weeks is like a, an average from beginning to end. Yeah. Well, do you have more than one piece going at a time? Occasionally I do, yeah. Um, I, I used to never do that. I used to never like the idea that I had one piece that was sitting there while the other one was being made. But I have found lately that these smaller pieces, work from small, I kind of like it. I kind of like being able to create a piece and set it aside for a little while. And then I can think about color or I can think about what I'm going to do to that one. Just let it sit and stew for a little bit over there in the corner, you know. And, and then I can work on another piece. And, yeah, I, th I kind of like it, actually. I like two or three pieces at once. Well, we have a few of your small pieces. We didn't include them in this group because we put them for sale uh, during the winter when you sent them to us because we had had requests from many people that they would like to see some of your small pieces as well. And we'll, we'll see some of them on camera in a little while, but the show that we're having today uh, is the culmination of an entire year's worth of work. Well, let's move on to uh, another piece. And if Derek, you wouldn't mind helping me put another piece on uh, display. How about the one that is cut out? Oh, and let's check the price on this one. This particular piece, I can't read that. Is it $7,900? Yes. $7,900. And the rock is thrown in for free. <laughs> we rock. Richard, yes, you rock, Richard. Absolutely, you <laughs> rock. <laughs> now the next one we're going to look at is just, it's, it's one of my favorite styles that you do. Uh, and this particular piece is already sold. Someone, while we were talking, purchased it, which was very nice. But uh, uh, this particular piece, as you can see, is all cut out. The flaps are out and it is ready to land. <laughs> and if you can see into that piece, you can see light through the piece. I'm trying to angle it a little so maybe the camera can yeah, pick up the fact that yeah. uh, these individual flaps were part of the body. They were then cut and then lifted uh, to form this sort of petal-like surface. But what's also wonderful is that hole, that interior, that the 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 rim and how it is uh, so much a part of the, the design. I mean, really, really just striking and unbelievable. But uh, so tell us how and when you make the decision as to where to put all of these, uh, part, uh, all of these flaps on, on this wonderful pot. Yeah. This one's kind of evolved from uh, a time when I was making pots uh, where I, I used that design, but I never did any cutting. And one of the reasons I can do this now is because living in Oklahoma, the humidity over here is fierce. So uh, the clay stays softer a lot longer. So I can create a whole, I can almost create the entire piece um, and then go back and start cutting. And while it's, you know, while it's drying, um, and it has to be just at the right time. If it's too dry, you're going to break those pieces. You, when you cut, you cut, and then you start pushing in, you know, you're pushing away. So it's got, the clay has got to be just at the right stage for that. 
if it's too soft, the whole thing can just start slumping. And so it's got to be stiff enough for it to hold itself up, but it's also got to be soft enough that you can still bend it. And this Oklahoma clay, like I said, this is like the best clay I've ever worked. Um, and it, and it, the neat thing about it too is that it takes a lot of different firing uh, degrees. So, so this one here has been fired three times, and it, three it, times, you know, just three times. And the reason part of that is because um, I'll fire it first uh, after it's all been cut out and there's no color or anything on it at the time, and I just color it. I fire it once just to harden it, and then I'll, what I'll do is I'll take a little air. Um, a little, um, what do you call it, air, airbrush? Yeah, airbrush? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's an airbrush. And I'll spray on this black slip and this black clay slip that's got a little bit of something. Now, I'm not even sure what it is because I actually, I, I buy this stuff. And it fuses on and it leaves kind of a, a surface that's almost like emery paper. And then I'll fire it again. And I'll fire it up to uh, 0.04 in an electric kiln. And that's pretty hot. I mean, when I, I unfortunately had the sad results of taking an older pot that I had to, to refire once, and because I wanted to do some repairs on it, and I fired it to 04, and the thing just about melted. So, so Arizona clay, I, I would not fire to 04, 04, which I'm not sure the temperature. I, Right offhand, I'd have to look at my chart here and find out. Uh, actually, I think I have it here. But, um, but anyway, and then once I take it out of the kiln after the second firing, it's just all black. Then I come back with clay colored slips and start doing all the painting with a tiny brush. They're just little, almost like little hairs, you know, little brushes, little liner, what they call liner brushes to make lines. Um, and as so you we got to three, three firings on this one here. And you and cone four is a a very high temperature. I mean, like a thousand degrees more. Yeah, let me check. Okay, me... and and Richard, we're having a little sound difficulties. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the sound difficulties have to do with the distance from the mic. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, that that's good. That's really okay. good. So go back just a little bit more, maybe. Oh, like this? Is, is, is that better? Is that better? Yep, that's better. That's better? Is it kind of puffing? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, puffing? it is kind of puffy and pop, popping and, and fuzzy. Okay. But, um, um, I might have been too close. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. just a little too close. Mm. But, well, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm just... Uh, here listening to every word. I mean, I'm just enthralled by uh, listening to uh, the process and everything. I mean, I, whenever you do demonstrations here, it's, first of all, it's never, never this much detail. And second of all, there's always a crowd of people around you. And it would be really weird if the if the owner started elbowing them out of the way because <laughs> she wants to learn something. But uh, I, you know, this is this is a real wonderful learning experience for me as well. Okay, let's let's. How's the sound doing now? Yeah, how does it? Sound? You need to talk some more. Okay, I'm talking. Let's see. How does it sound? Much better. <laughs> Much better. There you go. Okay, we're good. Maybe well, I was just getting too close. Yeah. No, I'm sorry you can't lick the microphone. That's not part of the process. Well, any, anyway, this, I mean, is a really gorgeous and, you know, one of my, the favorite styles that I see you do. And maybe we can have another piece um, so that we can talk about, make sure we have enough time to talk about all of them. Because once you go on Zoom, you won't be able to see the pieces like, you know, we're seeing them now. You'll be able to see all those nice people that are going to turn tune in uh, when it's time for us to do that. And that's going to happen at 1 o'clock. And right before 1 o'clock, what people will do is 
Uh, go online, change from YouTube, and go online to Zoom at andreafisherpottery.com. Go send an email. Send an email to, to Zoom at andreafisherpottery.com after 1 o'clock, and then you will re immediately receive back an invitation to join the Zoom um, the Zoom group. And, but anyway, now we, oh my goodness, this is just an outrageous, wonderful, wonderful piece. I know fall is coming, and, and I think this piece really, really epitomizes fall. And um, one of the things I think we should start talking about first is the coils. They're so different than the last two. What did you do? <laughs> so am I is the voice coming out pretty good now yeah, any yeah it's better okay um, yeah this one's kind of complicated um, it's <laughs> not not for beginners for sure um, I'll have to tell okay I'll just say this it's pretty much made upside down this pot is made upside down <laughs> yeah. I actually start with the top and then build it the other way, so it's kind of it's kind of hard to describe the process, but um, that will just confuse people more, though I think. But <clears throat> is this your uh, own little secret? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, there's a few little secret things in there going on. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a it's a building technique that me and Jamie both do, um, but it's one that we just kind of. Kept it a little under the under the radar a little bit as far as technique. Well, you know what else we're hearing? We're also hearing Santa Claus on the roof. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there there yeah. must be the prancing and dancing of hoofs. I, yeah. And, and while, all the little people up there all, dancing around. Yeah, all the we're little people. In the people. attic. And even though this pot is very much. Um, fall to me um, on your roof I think you have a little bit of, of winter for anyone who turned in it turns out that Richard's roofer came today and they removed shingles and they are now pounding in the nails into the roof wouldn't you know it, I mean those kinds of, of things it had, happen today. it had to happen today and um, and tell me about these beautiful oak leaves uh, that you put on this pot. How did you make them? Well, these are uh, they're post oak, so it's a local uh, kind of an oak that grows around our area. And we've actually got some that are huge, very massive ones on our property. Um, but a lot of them uh, were used. The oak was used for post posts because. It's a kind of wood that wouldn't rot so fast when, when it was put underground. So I'm pretty sure that's why it's called that. There's also another oak that's related to it called blackjack oak. And similar leaves, but the, the leaves on a blackjack almost look like um, Tweety Bird feet, kind of like three-toed, <laughs> kind of like fat little, uh, like if Tweety Bird was walking on the, in the mud and you leave that kind of print, that'd be the, the uh, blackjack oak uh, leaf. But this one's uh, uh, is often confused with it, but it's the post oak, and they're beautiful, and they're they're so waxy. They have this sort of waxy beauty to them. And the way I do this is, um, it's basically coiling. I'm actually the pot is made, and I'm and I'm putting a coil to outline the leaf. Okay, so I'm putting a very fine coil outlining the leaf, and then I'm smearing it, smearing it in. So the clay below it's going to be very soft. Um, so yeah, while I'm building, you know, these things have to be put in. So that's kind of why I was saying this one's a complicated one. It's kind of hard to describe because it's uh, I'm starting with the opening, starting with the top, and working down, and then I flip the whole thing over to finish it. It's and like a pineapple upside down cake, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. But you know, the first thing that uh, is so striking about this pot is the handle. 
Uh, mm. tell, tell us more about the handle. It looks so different than the other route that uh, we saw on the other piece that you did. Yeah, this one, this one, this one has a, does it have a stone in it or not? I can't remember. I can't see it from here. No. No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, I'm, I, I'm not really sure of the wood on this one. It might be the sycamore, but I've also stained it. So to get that color, I just used uh, leather dye. I use a, like a brown leather dye, mm -hmm. and then uh, layers after rubbing the heck out of it, uh, after it's been dyed with leather dye, then I, um, I put a finish on it, and just layers and layers of uh, either true oil, probably true oil, which is a gun stock finishing oil. So it's, yeah, sycamore root is not, um, it, it doesn't get very, how do you say, it's very hard to get a very slick surface on it. So you kind of have to build up um, layers of, uh, of the finish on it to give it that sheen. Yeah. Well, this root looks a lot rougher and has yeah. uh, sort of deep grooves in it and a lot more texture on it than the other root and it really does look like it could be from a, a different tree. Yeah, yeah. It, and it might be. I you know I, I think it's I think it's sycamore, but um, I, and the other one might be I can't no, I can't remember. <laughs> I, can't, I got a pile of roots. I've just got this pile. I, I'm always uh, pulling one out and sanding on it and thinking, I, I need to make a pot for this handle, you know, I, I need to make a pot for this root. Yeah. It's, I've got to get this root. This root is too cool, you know, it's too nice. I've got to get this thing out there. So are, are there. you slowly but surely destroying the forest in your area? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> because if I didn't pull these roots out, the next time I'd come down the creek, they'd be gone anyway from the flood, you know, they the oh. flood's always moving and, and tearing them out anyway. So yeah, there, there have been times when I thought, well, I'll just leave that one in for a little while longer, and then I come back later and it's gone. You know, it's been ripped out by water. What does that little creek flow year-round? Um, it has in the last two years, but normally it, it, about half of it dries out in our, in our property. So we have, down by our ceremonial grounds, there's always water in the creek there. Uh, because the creek is spring fed, and it's coming from the springs that are just around on the other side of the property. Um, and it's always, always clear. There's always beautiful minnows and, and crawdads in it. Um, I wouldn't drink out of, out, out of the creek, but we do have a spring, too, that flows into it, a big spring. And that thing, it, it takes about an hour to fill a, um, oh, a 350-gallon uh, tank with uh, with a hose that I've gotten into the spring. It's all gravity fed. Mm -hmm. it, it has a lot of pressure, and that's just one little little bit of hose. And so it's uh, yeah. So we have a lot of a lot of water here. Unfortunately, the soil in this area is just terrible. It's just awful soil. I can see why they put the Indians here. <laughs> so, <laughs> can't use this stuff for anything. Let's put the Indians here. Wow. Yeah, it was, but it, it, it's really a lot of, this area is a lot of cattle, so we'll see, you know, a lot, a lot of these fields are, are just um, really for grasses. Now, that, that particular pot is $6,900. Now, we have one here for $5,900 that is just completely different. It's a beautiful, beautiful plate that is mounted on a on a stand. Did you make the stand? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and certainly the stand comes with the plate as well. And uh, the stand, I mean, is so well executed. And also, it's a stand that won't harm uh, the piece of pottery as well. And what you've done on this piece is that you have made the coils um, sort of run around <laughs> the surface of, of the plate. Uh, is this technique any different from the technique that you've used on the other pieces? It's a little different because on this one, I actually, are, I'm coiling onto a slab. So it's like a, 
uh, have a plate form that's already laid. So a, a, a piece of clay, a thin piece of clay is laying in a bowl uh, or a plate form that I made also. Um, and then it's been trimmed. And then I start coiling, uh, starting at the bottom. And each coil is just kind of put little, little waves are put in that coil. And then the next coil follows, either follows the wave or else it kind of goes against the wave. And so you end up with these kind of crisscross um, wavy patterns that just go all over the place. But it's, they're basically going, the coil, if you follow it from one, one side to the other, it goes all the way across. They go all the way across. Each coil goes all the way across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, does the plate decide the, where the coils go, or does the clay decide where the coils go, or do you decide where the coils go? Yeah, I guess that's uh, I'm I'm the, the responsible one. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be, I have to claim responsibility. Uh huh. And so, did did you uh, sort of sketch out this design before you started, or or is it something that's very organic that just sort of happens? Oh yeah, this is this is like you just kind of go into a mode and you just start coiling and um, yeah, your mind could be a thousand miles away and you're just your hands are doing all the work and your your mind is just kind of on floating away, you know, somewhere so, else. And, sounds like pottery making is a bit of a narcotic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, I've been an addict for so many years, I don't know what it would be like to do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> a so, play addict. <laughs> so Richard, we have a question for you from Robert. Sure. And what influenced you to start adding handles to your pots? Well, I started um, in New Mexico, I guess, when I was, um, I was making pieces that looked more like baskets, I guess, you know, and, and the first idea, of course, was um, I was doing clay handles, you know, clay, just kind of spanning, spanning the opening. And then I started finding pieces of wood in New Mexico, like when I was hiking around up in the, uh, the Ponderosa Pines or the, the, the junipers and so it kind of started that way, and, and then I started, I was doing some where I was taking a piece of hose, soaker hose, and I was doing leather braiding around, and I did all the knots, I did special knots on the ends, and so I had to learn about Spanish braiding, and, um, and then I, I took it, I was influenced by a, a, a talk with a Linda elder in Quebec, he was talking to me about making snowshoes and steaming the wood, and so I did a little bit of that too, steaming uh, oak and bending it and, and wrapping it with uh, leather. So yeah, it's just, they've kind of evolved. And, and I, I started getting to the place where I just like, I'm looking for a certain curve. And, you know, I used to collect every cool stick I could find. And then I realized it's like, I can't, this is a cool stick, but I don't know what to do with it. And so now I'm a lot more selective when I'm out there looking around. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this tree stump and I'm seeing the roots, but I'm going, mm, it's beautiful, but I can't use it. Or I don't see how I can use it. So I just have to leave it, let it be, let it be there. And, but if something just jumps out at me and it's like, oh, oh, that's gonna look, this would just, this is so nice, you know. It's kind of like a collaboration with nature, I guess. I feel like that's what a lot of this is. It's just kind of, you know, saying, look what Mother Earth did here. I mean, that is awesome. <laughs> People need to see this. And if I don't show it, it's going to get washed down the creek and, you know, dumped into the lake or buried in mud. So, and, yeah. And it will I, be I think uh, we're a good team. I hope we're a good team, Mother Earth. And... Now, tell me about the rim of this pot, this plate. Uh, I believe this is one where I painted it with a, a black and then I scraped away my little design, kind of like a little feather pattern. Oh yeah, on the back too, yeah. Okay, so that's how I did. I took a, um, that black slip that I was telling you about and I sprayed it over the entire surface of a burnished piece. So the pot had already been burnished. So then I spray this stuff on it very lightly. Um, and then as, as after it's dry, I take little wooden sticks, little skewers, like the kind you get in a sandwich from the deli. And I save those, by the way. 
<laughs> little bamboo sticks or wooden ones, and, and then just real delicately just start scraping away. And so you don't want to scratch too hard because then you can scratch, you know, the part that was, um, you know, that you just burnished. So the, the trick is just being very gentle and just removing just that black that you want uh, lifted off. That's pretty much it, though. That's the technique. So it's sort of like a scraffito technique, where you scratch into the surface. Yeah. But, but this is not... Oh, yeah, it's a little dimensional. I mean, I can mm -hmm. feel that it's that these are... These feel different, the fat ones feel different than the, the skinny ones. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's... In a, in a, some of that... Uh, I mean, I was always impressed, too, with Greek pottery, the old Greek stuff, you know, and I just love that black on red and, and all those kind of things, too. So that's, it got me thinking, you know, all those, all that ancient stuff just gets me thinking. I'm, you know, I'm just not really inspired when I look at some of the contemporary art world. I mean, I, I'm always inspired by techniques, and I go, that's a cool technique, but I just... I, you know, it's the ancient, it's, it's the ancient stuff that always draws me the most. You know, that's my inspiration. And, and also a walk in the woods. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. instead of uh, looking at contemporary art, you should look at natural art, the, the pieces yeah, that Mother Nature sure. uh, creates. Uh, this gorgeous piece uh, has an awful lot to do with old Mother Nature. I mean, there are, yeah. are all of the the plants that uh, she gives us. And um, this piece also has this interesting rim as well. Was, could you start talking about the, uh, the plants a little first? Yeah, this one, this one has the contrast. You know, in our creation stories, um, we don't have like the patriarchal systems of uh, the dualism, which is like ultimate good fighting ultimate evil. Oh, we, what we have is much more like yin and yang. You know, it's more of a balance. It's like you have these forces, you have winter and then you have summer. You have a night and you have day. You have violence and then you have peace. It's like all these things kind of balance one another. And so in this piece, this one's kind of like um, showing you the balance. This is what the balance of nature is. It's not always polite. Um, nature can be brutal. Nature can be a bitch. <laughs> you know, she can rip your head off. Um, and so there's the fire, you know, aspect there, and how fire itself, you know, it, it cleanses out a forest, and it can take care of the dead growth. But by by leaving, it leaves uh, certain plants that that are required that need that, you know, that that popping the, the the hulls of their their root or their seed seeds and everything. So. It's, it's like, it's just showing the balance, the balance of things. And the rim itself is much more of like a, like our traditional wind up uh, rim. We see this kind of a rim like this on a lot of the old pots, the cooking pots. And and people in our uh, our ancestral people just love those those parallel lines, you know, just parallels and diamonds and, and, and triangles. I mean, that just, it shows up on all the old pots. You never see anybody putting in a curved line. They're always straight lines, parallel lines. Interesting. Well, you know, it's interesting too that this top area looks like it is a piece of leather. It's polished yeah. so well that it has the sense of it being leather that's attached to it and, and even stitched on, stitched onto uh, the surface, but it's not leather it's clay and that I mean I just wanted to make that point because you know it has that look and that feel uh, of a piece of leather when in fact uh, everything here is is clay but yeah. uh, this is a particularly lovely piece I think that um, it's the the plants and, and of course I'm a plant lover but the plants <laughs> look so uh, real and um, uh, uh, the coloration is so beautiful. I hope that's coming across on the, on the screen because uh, that sort of subtle mauve color with the, against the brown and then that sort of minty, grayish minty green is uh, really a beautiful, beautiful combination. 
Um, and, Thank you. Yeah, well, you know that I love your pots, and, and we love you too because you, you know you're just such a good guy. Now we have a couple more. There's two, one. Two. We have two. We have two more. We have. Uh, let it, let's see the one with the lid because that's going to um, go back to nature too and that's going to take a little bit of time. Like I said, this one is $6,900. The one with the, the lid uh, is a good transition from uh, the one we just saw, but carefully we'll, we'll move all the pieces. I'll take the lid first and... Oh, that camera is on. No, okay. And before we, uh, I put the lid on, I'd like to be able to show you the lid. Oh, it's this piece is seventy five hundred. I put the lid on. Well, here's what the lid looks like on the inside. Playing a lid, and then <laughs> there's the beautiful lid with all the exposed coils, and of course that the, that arrow design in this wonderful dark gray with this what looks like a leather knob on the top that's stitched onto the pot, but it's not. It's all clay. And then, if we put this lid on top, there we go, we can match those lines that start in the beginning and come all the way down to the bottom of the piece. And while we saw the new growth on the last pot, on this pot, we're seeing the bloom. And are these particular flowers that are that you painted on the pots? Oh, these are ones that just kind of come from my mind when I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm just working almost at a frantic paint just to put these designs in because I have to, I have to actually scratch the design in before the clay gets too hard. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm just, it's almost like, again, it's another zone. I have to go into the zone and just start doing it. I just start putting them down. Um, and I just look at one panel and go, oh, no, can't repeat that one. All right, I got to go to a different, I need a different shape. Okay, I'll go to this shape. Oh, this will look good together. You know, so it's just, it's quick decisions, and um, I just go at it. I, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, these are inspired by uh, a lot of the Iroquois, um, oh, beadwork that you see, beadwork, or, or, or also um, the... Um, moose hair embroidery that the windnut used to do and also some of the porcupine um, uh, work too that's, that you see Did on you? black buckskin so this is kind of my um even though the forms and of course you know aren't traditional necessarily the the pottery form the these uh, mounting flowers like this the pieces were uh, a lot of the the buckskin was done with this kind of floral stuff and on these pieces, I kind of, it's a mix between realism and mixture. So I have like, like on that one there, you see leaves coming out from other sides, kind of coming out like it's, you're just getting a glimpse between trees or something. Uh, on both of these, and this one too, you see the same thing. Leaves are just kind of coming. On other ones I've done, I've made it much more geometric, like that last piece where the everything's very geometric and it fills in at just the right place. And some of these have a little more, a um, little more sporadic. But to me, it's still important. Negative space and positive space, they have to be balanced. Wow. Well, you know? yes, the, I noticed, uh, well, first of all, moose hair embroidery. Who, yeah. Who gets to... You know, what beauty parlor does the moose get to go to to get their hair removed? Uh, uh, that's not something, that's not a Wyandotte tradition, is it? It is, actually. It's a Wendat tradition from Quebec. Uh, I don't know, you know, where, um, you know, when it came along. I'm sure it came from the homeland, so I'm sure all our ancestors did it. But it is very, very tedious work. It's like taking um, the porcupine quill 
uh, and flattening it, but it's moose hair. So they take the, the longest pieces of moose hair that come along the neck, and some of them are up to eight inches long, and, and it's flattening them, it's dyeing them. And, and the cool thing about a moose hair is that it's dark on one end and it gets light on the other end. So when you dye it, you'll get like a dark green going to a pale green. So when you do a, a, an embroidery with that, on say a leaf, you'll get the, it'll, the, the leaf will start out with a light color, and then as you get to the point of the leaf, it turns dark. So you get this beautiful shading going on, and it just naturally occurs. So I've seen jackets that are just completely covered with moose hair embroidery uh, huh. of just vines. And, and they're all, you know, all the plants that you see, it's like these are all from somebody's mind. They're just kind of making things up. But, yeah. but they're just amazing. But yeah, they, you can find them online if you look to them. These all look yeah. like wildflowers. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Lots and lots of wildflowers. And if, if you notice, if the reason that I keep turning it is because every panel is different. And uh, a, a beautiful, beautiful floral pieces. We've had a little difficulty that I need to explain. Um, I have given you a few prices along the way, and some of those prices are incorrect. Uh, apparently, the person who put the price cards together with the pieces didn't do it right, and so uh, no, and, oh, and now now they're all correct, and they're all correct on our website as well. And so I apologize for uh, that because we were in a big hurry this morning because being able to do. YouTube and uh, Zoom and having the pots here and having you uh, in the house of uh, pounding nails in Oklahoma uh, was, was rather complicated and we really couldn't combine the two because the pots are so beautiful and the pots have such tiny, tiny little coils that the quality of uh, what we would be producing would be so bad that you would never have the opportunity to see all of them. But this particular piece is $7,500 with, uh, with this gorgeous, gorgeous floral arrangement. And what I love about it is, you know, there are eight sections in this pot, so you really get eight pots for the price of one, because yeah. every day you could put a different wildflower or a flower of Richard's imagination out there in front uh, to admire. And uh, a beautiful, beautiful piece. We have one more that is a technical masterpiece. And it's going to take us a little bit of time to remove the piece with the lid, uh, only because we want to make sure that um, they both stay whole. And, uh, and we'll bring the, the one that I truly believe is a technical masterpiece. We've sort of saved that one for last. Now, in, in 10 minutes, we are going to, uh, oh, oh, here it is. It's sitting in front of me. I'm just the luckiest person in the universe. But in 10 minutes, we're going to switch from YouTube to Zoom. And very shortly after we talk about this uh, piece of pottery, that I will... Um, tell people how to do that so that, you know, they can talk to you in, in person, that you can tell them a little bit about what you're up to in beautiful downtown Oklahoma, that you might be able to sing a few songs, you might be able to do a little drumming, and that um, you can talk a little bit about your clay endeavor. But uh, Richard, uh, how in the heck did you ever do this? <laughs> very carefully, very carefully. Very carefully. Yeah, it's, it's another one that's cut out, so there's you know, parts that were removed, you know, after it was built. So it's one of those, again, that uh, it really helps to have humidity to build something like that, because um, otherwise, 
Yeah, if I was, I don't know if I could do that in New Mexico or, or well, Arizona. The potters, I yeah, the potters I've talked to have said, oh, yeah, 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 the pot sort of harden up in a half an hour or so, and then, you know, and maybe two or three hours later, they, they're dry as a bone. Um, yeah. And here, today, this morning, for example, I uh, heard all the weather forecast on the news, and hopefully we're going to get a little... Uh, rain because the humidity is a whopping 34 uh, <laughs> percent and so what what's the humidity at your place normally I don't know I think you could probably swim in it though occasionally you know, <laughs> swim off the porch <laughs> maybe that's why I have flying dreams out here more you know it's like I feel like I'm swimming yeah. yeah, just like swimming through the air. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell us a little more about this piece. Okay, this is another one that uh, kind of has the, the same sort of secrets and built into the construction process. So it's it's a little bit of a, I don't know, it's not like I like to keep lots of secrets, but I do have some secrets that I keep only to me and my students and those who... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the world's a, a, a playroom, right? So it's like people can learn all kinds of techniques every every which way. And they can guess and they can try to figure it out. But it's still all coil built. It's all tiny coils mm -hmm. and overlapping coils. So you see that there's parts of them that have been overlapped. Um, and, of course, if you got a real close-up to it, you could see that. You could see there's, you know... Um, uh, all the all the overlapping. So there's so much overlapping in this pot. It's almost like you're doing it. You're making two pots because you're wiping out whatever you put down. Basically, oh, you're wiping out another coil. So yeah, it's a lot of putting coils down and then you cover them up with another you know bunch of coils. So yeah, it's it's a little crazy, but and it's again it's one that's finished uh, by turning it upside down and finishing it. Mm -hmm. So it's basically started at the at the top. Up. Well, one of the things, one of the questions people have asked is, is this really, really, really fragile? And my guess is that if you drop it, just like any piece of ceramic, it's going to break. But no, it isn't, because we've been able to ship the pieces that you have cut out in the past without any problems whatsoever. We have all in-house packing and um, because we do it ourselves, uh, we make sure that it is so overpacked that UPS could drop kick it to your home wherever you live <laughs> and it would survive. Uh, and we know that UPS will drop kick it. But yeah. Uh, that, yeah. But anyway, uh, we do all of our in-house packing, and so it is really easy uh, to to send it to other places. Uh, if you wish to come to Santa Fe to pick up your little babies, uh, if you purchase any of these pieces, uh, that we certainly don't mind at all. But this particular piece is. This particular masterpiece, I should say, uh, technical masterpiece and aesthetic masterpiece is $8,500. Uh, uh, unbelievable. And so we've had eight pieces here that took Richard an entire year to make. We also have a small selection of pieces that uh, are a little more historical that are in the secondary market that, pe that Richard, we were able to obtain that Richard uh, made uh, quite a while ago. And uh, we are pretty much coming uh, close to the end. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay a piece of paper that I hope you can see in front of this piece of pottery. On, Stop going away. Yeah. Because I want to make sure it's, it's four minutes before this session is over. And I want everybody to be able to see uh, the uh, Zoom email 
Zoom at Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery if you wish to join the conversation. Um, and I will be a, a small part of that conversation, but in the meantime, I would like you to be able to, there we go, can you see it now? Well, there's a little bit of a delay, and ah, it's bending. Sorry. But what I'd like to be able to do is to say to you, Richard, oh, thank you, thank you so much for your time and your wonderful stories and, and your adventures with Mother Nature and sharing some of the um, techniques and, and um, that you use to make these incredible and absolutely breathtaking pieces. Uh, you are such a treasure, not only to the whole world, but to especially to your own people because they have someone that is so tied and so connected and so willing to uh, put themselves out like you do to guarantee the heritage of your people. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for those words. It really means a lot to Jeanne. Jeanne, to you too. Thank you. So if anybody would like to speak with Richard, all they need to do is send an email from your email address to zoom at andreafisherpottery.com. And once you send that email, you'll get a reply. That reply will have the meeting invite, and you'll just be able to log on via Zoom and talk to Richard directly. And we want to thank everybody for helping us, including Richard, and we think it's quite wonderful that everything happened. And again, all you do is send an email to zoom at andreafisherpottery.com, and you will receive an auto-reply, which will be, the, uh, which will be the, the meeting invite into Zoom. Well, thank you. Are we going to sign off now? Give people a chance to do that? Or do they have to wait until exactly 1 o'clock? No, we've already got one person here that can talk if they'd like, if they're connecting to audio. Good. Now, can you see me on that Zoom?